and welcome out to our halftime report here on a Wednesday, 11 21, 2018. Got Coach Matt, Coach Tim, and Producer Cody here for our daily show from Tackle Trading. Matt, Thanksgiving tomorrow, obviously, here in the U.S., and uh, we've got mostly a U.S. audience, not, not exclusively. We do have a lot of students from around the globe, but uh, getting ready. Got a big holiday here. Uh, obviously, the markets are going to be closed tomorrow, half a day on Friday, so this is the last full day of trading for the week. We'll have a shortened session on Friday. How are you doing today? You know, Tim, uh, doing really well. Uh, Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday, and and it's not close for me. Family, friends you know, just Thanksgiving dinner, cooking, cleaning, watching football, conversating about politics and religion and money and everything else you're not supposed to talk about. And, you know, uh, th I, I'm very thankful that I don't have to apologize for getting all my family to lose their money in Bitcoin last year. <laughs> I'm very thankful for that. Um, but uh, no, I, I, I'm very excited going down to the good old, uh, good old, uh, you know, God's country, we like to call it, uh, Emory County, Utah. And uh, that's where both our families are from, Tim. And, you know, me and my wife, are, uh, my wife's family's from down there as well. And, you know, I don't get down to Emory County very much, uh, yeah, but uh, look forward to getting down there and seeing uh, seeing how that uh, town has not changed one iota since we left that town in the 90s. It's not changed at all? It's not changed at all. <laughs> By the way, we they, had a they thing. Did get a stop site. They did get a stoplight a few years ago, Tim. First yeah. one we've ever had. It was a big moment for the, for the people of Huntington. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to stopping at that stop sign, uh, that stoplight one time. And uh, it's going to be exciting. Listen, I mean, one thing that I loved about our household is that politics and religion and, and most of those things uh, were not off the table. Literally, no, no, I, I, was, I was serious. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I was serious. That, you know, it's, it's amazing when you get around the justice household. Uh, we're very open minded. We're very, we'll talk about anything. We don't get offended. And uh, it's 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 I, I, I thoroughly enjoy those conversations. So I, I was being serious on that. But a uh, big shout out to all of Tackle Trading. Happy Thanksgiving to all of the halftime crew, all of our members, our students. Um, just want to say thank you for uh, supporting this halftime show, supporting us over there at Tackle Trading. Uh, very thankful for you guys. And uh, happy Thanksgiving. Safe travels if you're traveling. And, and obviously, this will be our last one of the week, Tim. Uh, but we'll be back with you guys on Monday. Yeah. Well, our, yeah, I agree with that. So, all right. Moving the market. Stocks are now kind of bouncing back here, trying to give some people some relief before the holiday so that they don't all have to panic over Thanksgiving dinner about a bear market, I guess. But we well, are getting a bounce. They're going to they're, they're, they're gonna panic. There's nothing going on today, Tim. That, yeah. I mean, we can sit there and we can just say, oh, man, look at the, you know, the double uh, potential double bottom, uh, you know, hitting into the same support levels. Tim, there's this is nothing today. No, the traders aren't focusing on today. The traders are traveling and they're going to, into the Hamptons in New York and you're going to have low volume and low volatility today. I don't expect a lot of uh, crazy, crazy price movements. Um, but uh, you, you're basically seeing a technical bounce with very light volume off of uh, support. That's what you're seeing today. I wouldn't take anything too much out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> the advanced decline line on the New York Stock Exchange is about two and a half to one. Most stocks are bouncing back very slightly here today. Like you talked about, it doesn't really change it technically. Uh, but let's break it down one step at a time here and start with the ES. You want to start with Verizon? No, I was just looking at John's question on Verizon. Uh, sure. Make sure make sure we come back to John's question, though, Tim. Sure. We'll make sure that we hit uh, Verizon at some point here. So on the ES, Matt, obviously you're trying to double bottom, and I don't believe that you've confirmed that at all. We know that. We, we would not get confirmation unless it broke above that intraday trend line going back up. Give me a thorough technical read on the S&P. Where is support? Where do you got resistance? Support support right here is at 2630 in my estimation. It, it's over here, you know, multiple different times. That's where it kind of hit the low. You also hit it yesterday. You hit it today before it re, uh, rebounded. So you got 2630 right here. If you drop this down into the intraday channel here, you can kind of see that come down, slow down into that 2630 level. So I would look at 2630 from an overall you know, support level from, from the daily chart. Interday has different support levels and whatnot, but you also have 2,600 here. So anything between 2,630 and 2,600, that's where that zone of support is, is now forming on the ES contract. And, and, and if we do end up breaking 2,630, it's not going to happen today. And I don't think it's going to happen on Friday either, but 
coming into next week, let's say that we see this continue, this selling continue, the selling pressure continue. If you see that, a break of 2630 would be a day trading uh, entry zone uh, with the target of 2600. And that's a pretty good little day trade, but that's obviously not happening today. Like I said, Tim, I'm, I'm not taking much from today. Fills are slow with the, with, uh, with the brokers. It's everything's slowing down a little bit. This is what we see over Thanksgiving every single time. Every single year we see this on Thanksgiving. Every single year we see, see it for the last you know 10 trading days uh in 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 the christmas season tim uh, wall street walks away chicago walks away san francisco walks away the trading uh the trade justice boys here in uh, salt lake city we're uh, you know i'm leaving down to emory county right after this show you know it's uh, you know i got my orders in everything's you know hunky-dory i'm not looking to do anything else yeah, definitely. And there's a lesson there, by the way, you should not have to be tied to the market 24 hours a day, and you should be able to, to step and walk away and go live your life. There's no doubt about it. Theta giving is something that Coach Gino talks about uh, quite often, where you want to take advantage of these holiday weekends and, and usually capture some Theta. Let's go to uh, John's question on Verizon. Here. Yeah, let me get John's question. So John, you're, you're looking at in the money, you're in the money on Verizon puts at 60. I'm assuming you didn't short this stock because you shouldn't short this stock, especially in a, uh, I, I'm assuming you've sold puts, John, is what I'm assuming. Would you agree with that, Tim? Everyone, I'm new to the halftime uh, crew question. IDM uh, on Verizon puts for 60 bucks. What's your thoughts on this stock? I mean, if you're buying put options, those are probably yeah, going to be slightly things, John. Okay, two things, John. If you have bought put options, you never buy a put option in a in an uptrend on a stock that is a safe haven. That that's number one. Number two, if it's short put options at sixty, if you if this is something you want to own at sixty, I don't have any problem with owning Verizon at sixty in a market like this in a trend like this. However, that John in in the way that we approach those naked puts is we typically like to sell it at a support level that we're comfortable owning. So for example, if I was looking at potentially selling a naked put on Verizon here, I would look for a support level somewhere in this range that I'm comfortable with. As the stock is going up, 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 you don't want to sell a, a, a close to in the money option. You want to sell that option down here around somewhere around a 0 0.20 delta at a support level that you're willing to take ownership. So if I if I was looking at that, I would say, OK, I would much rather let me see the strike prices here just to kind of answer it here. What's up, Fortino? Um, look at 57, 56. So, you know, coming down here, Tim. I would I would be much more comfortable selling a 56 put option on Verizon. It's at a very important old resistance zone. That's right where the 50 day moving average is. Most likely you're not going to get down there, which means you're just going to cash flow. So, you know, John, without you know giving any type of advice or anything like that, it does seem like two things happen here, John. Number one, you probably were a little aggressive with your delta you were selling, and now you have that you have that conversation. I'm, I'm in the money now. Do I want to take ownership now? Well, that question should be answered before you ever make the trade. Correct, Tim? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So, so if, if, if you are now asking yourself that question on, well, do I really want to take possession at 60? There's probably something already wrong in the actual trade setup. And it's because you probably were just a little too aggressive. So mm -hmm. close to an at the money option, right? So it looks like there were some rule violations here. Well, it depends. I mean, obviously, if John has crafted his own system, we could be open minded to that. But oh, based on the absolutely, yeah, based on uh, the systems that we trade that we usually teach when we're working in coaching, mentoring, and in our courses at tackle trading and uh, whatnot, uh, we wouldn't be selling an in the money put option. You know, that's not no, usually the no. design. So a fifty six strike, something out of the money. If you want to get bullish, there's a lot of different ways. Delta Tuesday, we've gone back in the past, Matt, where we've talked about bull call spreads a call option, straight call option. There are other ways to get bullish. Well, and, and I like again, the idea. I don't have any problem with somebody selling an at the money put option on something that they want to take possession of in a bullish uptrend, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, that, that's fine, right? But you, but when you're doing that, that decision should already be made that if it goes in the money, I'm willing to take possession of it. But with that said, Verizon has been a wonderful company in this environment of crazy volatility, right? It, 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 it's been what it's been like the, the Coca-Cola, the McDonald's, uh, the Dr. Peppers, uh, some of those other types of for, uh, Pfizer's uh, Merck's uh, some of those other companies that have done actually fairly well 
in this volatile environment. Verizon is certainly in that conversation, Tim. So again, if I'm looking to take possession, I got no problem selling that. But that decision to take possession should have been made when you made the trade. Uh, back to the S&P here for a minute, kind of looking at some of the major names that are moving. Foot Locker had earnings last night up 14%. Give me FL, if you would. Uh, yeah, biggest gainer on the S&P today. Breakout gap, guys. That's a, that's a breakaway gap. Neut neutrality, breaking out of the range, that's a breakaway gap. Keep your eye on that. Keep your eye on Foot Locker if this is a company you track staying above 52, Tim. Something above 52 would be confirmation. You know, obviously a nice little breakout there on earnings. I do remember, in fact, this takes me back. My first year in college, I applied for a job at Foot, Foot Locker and the manager said, I don't think you're Foot Locker material. Didn't make it past the uh, first interview. <laughs> you, got, you got to die to Foot Locker. Huh? I didn't even know this stock was still an S&P 500 company, to be fair. Uh, the fact that it is making the biggest move here today. When's the last time you were at a Foot Locker to buy a pair of shoes? I don't go to the mall, dude. I'm way too old. Uh, hey, Tim, don't let it bother you. The, the founder of Baba got turned down from KFC. Oh, is that <laughs> yeah. right? KFC. Yeah, they, what was it? They they were hiring twenty seven people for a new KFC that was opening. They hired twenty six. He was the one guy they didn't hire. Oh my goodness! I, listen, speaking of old old jobs that didn't work out, when I was in law school, Tim, I got fired from a clothing shop after two days of work because I refused to go in because there was a softball tournament. So I got fired because I went to a softball tournament and, and I never found out how to actually fold clothes the right I, way. I do remember that. Yeah. Autodesk also had earnings last night. ADSK, if you'll take a look at that up about 8% leading the market here, not yeah, a great okay. handle. No, no, there's a difference here. And, and, and again, we just like to take these moments when we see things as a teaching moment. You're looking at two companies, both Foot Locker and Autodesk that had similar responses to earnings, right? OK, mm -hmm. the difference is uh, it, from a technical perspective, Autodesk gapped up into resistance then immediately started selling off. Foot Locker gapped above resistance and has held its head above resistance. So if you're looking at these two companies, Tim, you know, Autodesk versus Foot Locker, and I'm not saying there's a comparison here, but to me, Foot Locker is certainly the better candidate. Mm -hmm. LB is up. Uh, they've got an next dividend date here today, Matt. Uh, you know, one thing about dividends, you got to know when that payment date is. LB Brands, obviously coming back just a little bit, but after it was down huge on earnings yesterday. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, coming back a little bit, uh, that dividend's not going to uh, not going to uh, make it feel any better off that earnings gap from yesterday, though. Yeah, Win Resorts making a recovery rally here, six point four percent. Are, are you looking at a potential reversal here on Win Tim? I mean, this was a company we had on the the, the options report, on the bear options report for, I mean, we had it on for like- Four months. Six, <laughs> yeah, five, six months. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I am seeing a subtle change in the trend here on Win. You're looking at is slowing momentum. You're looking at potential double bottoms. You still have decreasing resistance zones, but keep an eye on this as a potential reversal candidate at Halftime Crew. You know, if the resorts and the casinos actually are reversing, that's probably a good indication because a lot of what Wynn's chart was looking like was the international markets and the emerging markets. Mm -hmm. I know that when you think Wynn Resort, you probably think Las Vegas, but they have resorts all over the world. Uh, EEM is a very similar pattern to what Wynn was in. I would be, in fact, Matt, if you look at the pivot to pivot relationships, you're almost identical there. They've been tracking each other quite closely. Yeah. They have. yeah. Same thing with a lot like uh, Baba. You see no. a little, little the same type of pattern here developing. And, and that could give a little bit of a boost to the market, Tim, if we see a lot of these stocks, these international stocks that, that are tied to the international markets. If we start to see those turn around, Tim, we've seen this in the past where those international companies go into bearish territory, but then start turning around a little quicker than the U.S. markets do. So it's mm -hmm. gonna, So keep an eye on EEM, -E keep an eye on BABA, keep an eye on WIN and some of those other international companies. They're all slowing down here. I'm not ready to call them bullish, Tim. Okay. I'm not there, but I am ready. To, I'm certainly ready to say they're neutral right now. Win, mm -hmm. Baba, EEM. EEM is in a symmetrical triangle right now. Okay. So, so if we start to see a little bit of those international components start to show upward movements in price, those could be good buying opportunities. Baba's, uh, take Baba, for example, Tim. Baba was on the bearish list for, for three straight months, right? But yet, this is, it would, wouldn't you agree this is a wonderful company? Yeah, it is a great company. Yeah. I've always put, well, first of all, we put it on the tackle 25 for a reason. And it does lead the question, Matt, uh, kind of naturally, 
Is it possible that the emerging markets and the, and the international markets that were beaten up so badly can be the first ones to lead us back into an uptrend if we are going to get a uh, No, it's not only possible, it's likely. Yeah, That's what happened in 2014 and 2015, Tim. You saw the international markets coming down versus the U.S. markets, were, which were basically stagnating. And then once the market found its footing, those international markets skyrocketed for a couple of years. Keep an eye on that. We'll, we'll definitely take a deep dive sometime in December on that. Yeah, some stocks losing today on the S and P. Not everything. Not many things are down, but Best Buy is down. Obviously, going into a Cyber Monday and fr Black Friday sales, retail has taken it on the chin here in the last week and a half. Mm -hmm. Best Buy not looking very good. Earnings report was not very strong, and you've got a bunch I, of I, news coming out. I would stay away from most retail right now on the buy side. Yeah. Yeah, ABBV also down, Philip Morris, Morris also down, but not a lot of companies down. NVIDIA is down 2%. Uh, the biggest losers on the S&P are only down 2 2.5%. It's mostly an update on the market. The advanced decline line, 414 to 80. So you're, you're mostly bullish here today. Let's move on to the Dow Jones Industrial, the YM contract. Double bottom on the S&P is also trying to form a double bottom here on the Dow, Matt. Give me a technical yeah. read on the Dow. Same, same read, Tim. Uh, honestly, you know, the Dow had been outperforming the S&P, um, especially in this run, uh, where, whereas the S&P kind of hit its head on that overhead resistance at 7,200. The Dow broke out, set a higher high. And ever since then, it kind of was outpacing the S&P. But over the last few days, Tim, it has caught up to it. And now they're, they're, they're basically technically matching one another right now. Both the S&P, the Russell 2000, as well as the Dow Jones are all trying to hold support levels. It's going to be a very important next, uh, week in the market next week. And Tim, I'm going to say this very clearly. Even if we break down on Friday, I'm not going to give too much credence into that simply mm -hmm. because there's going to be very little participation there. The, 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 it's not Friday and it's not today that I'm looking at for this potential breakdown or, or, or the potential recover. We're in that moment in time where it could go either way. It's next week that I'm looking at and we'll be here every day next week with you guys, with the crew to, to, to you know, analyze that if it does. Sure. Most active stock on the Dow is always pretty much the most active stock in the market by volume and, and volatility is Apple Computer, AAPL. Uh, the amount of value this company represents is huge. And it's got a little bit of a red candle here today. No, nothing yes. to see here, Matt. In the last month and a half, this company, Apple, the biggest company in the world, has wiped out $260 billion in market cap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Think about how big that is. Gone. Yeah. And it's only in the last month and a half. $265 billion. That's, that's an amazing, amazing number. You would think with the market recovering in the NASDAQ, the Dow, S&P, Apple would get a boost. It's, it's not, Tim. It, mm -hmm. It's not getting a boost here. Remember, Apple's been downgraded twice in the last month, Tim, by, by Goldman Sachs. Now, just, just to make sure everybody understands, the, the, the halftime crew has downgraded you know, Goldman Sachs multiple times in the last month as well, right? Mm -hmm. So let's not, you know, throw throw shade here at Goldman. But Goldman Sachs has downgraded the biggest company in the world's price target twice in the last month. That is that's not something that's just gonna get shooken out in 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 the noise, Tim. That is a very important situation. I don't think this stock is just going to have a V-shaped recovery. I think it's going to take some time. It's the most important company in the market for me and for many people as well. And, uh, you know, I was very, very bullish when it was bullish. And now I'm bearish while it's bearish, you know. And we've talked about the weakness on the earnings day by day by day by day. You can't get stuck on an opinion, guys. you got to trade what you see right if now. Anybody, that's if anybody bullish. says to me in the next month, but it's Apple, <laughs> they're, I, I, they're getting deleted. Yeah, but they make the iPhone, Matt. <laughs> you want to uh, look at the VIX next? <laughs> I like it. Um, on the Dow Jones Industrial, most active stocks here today and top gainers, Chevron, Microsoft, Caterpillar, DuPont, and Exxon. You're getting a little bit of a bounce in energy here, Matt. Chevron and Exxon about 2% back up. It's I'm electric. bearish on energy. It's just a, a relief rally. Crude oil is relief rallying, yeah. and so you're getting a bounce in the energy stocks. Look at this relief rally in crude, though, and I keep coming back to it. But look at this trend line. Mm. And now it's just coming right into it again. If it breaks out, runs, we might get a little bit of a reversal in crude. 
But that trend line is very, very consistent, Tim. It's got to get above that trend line. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to crude here in a minute. Obviously, markets, um, when you look at crude oil, that downward pressure is significant. And on a day-by-day basis, the headlines can be misleading. Same thing with the stock market here today. The headline is going to say stock markets rally into Thanksgiving, but they're just rallying off of very weak technical levels. In fact, as we look at the uh, gainers and losers here today, Matt, a lot of these stocks that are bouncing back, they're bouncing back off of their low points, obviously. Not exactly a strong market like we've been talking about. Uh, let's go on from the Dow, the s and Look at the NASDAQ next, third index that we always oh, look at. Very quickly, Tim, mm-hmm. the, the market's rallying a little bit, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. But what, it's, what is it rallying on today? What's, what's the news that it's rallying on? What's the positive news it's rallying on? Three, two, one, China, China trade deal? Durable project. goods orders, dear earnings. Okay, dear that's fine. Today. But yeah. core durable goods was a negative report. Consumer yeah. confidence was a negative report today. So mm-hmm. the two reports that we had today were both negative, right? I mean, we could be approaching the, the, the market I hate the most. Bad news is good news. I hate Bad that. Bad news is I good news. I hate that market. market. It drives me absolutely crazy because the fed isn't coming off their stance but we had two negative reports today not very bad consumer confidence came in at 97.5 versus an, an estimate 98.4 uh core dur- durable goods came in 0.1 off an expectation of 0.4 durable goods came in at negative 4.4 versus an expectation of negative 2.2 so you know the economic reports we saw weren't good today this is a technical bounce off support with limited participation. It's a it, it's what I like to call a nothing burger. That's what today is. That's a goose egg. They did not nothing burger on Monday night. They are not going to nothing burger in the Detroit uh, Bears game tomorrow. They uh, could they could nothing burger in that game. There's no question in the there's no way in the world too many too much offense in that You're game. You're excited. You're excited for tomorrow. I'm you fired are, up. Yeah, for sure. Bears. I did see some information in the durable goods orders about aircraft, uh, you know, obviously orders and whatnot that were down as well. Boeing has been a weak stock. It is bouncing back today with the market, but only a 1% bounce back, Matt. Not exactly a strong chart. I'm very concerned about well, that Boeing chart, by the way. So am I, but concerning the aircraft, the aircraft orders in the durable mm-hmm. goods order uh, economic report, that is stripped out of the, the, the report that most of the market looks at, Tim. So you have core durable goods and then you have durable goods. Mm-hmm. Airline orders are typically stripped out simply because they're, they're known as volatile, right? And so they're not a great economic indicator for business expansion because they are random in their orders. But that was a negative component today. But even without that negative component, that report was a negative report today. Yeah. Uh, give me deer, if you would. Obviously, they had earnings here today, and uh, it did have a positive. It's one of deer. D-E. 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 Yeah. D-E. Right. Yeah. Bouncing back, Matt, but still very, very weak. I've been bearish on the stock for a while. I was going to put it on the option report if it didn't have earnings because of the breakdown below support. Yeah. Obviously, now the earnings is bringing you back into a moving average soup. Not a real clear trigger here for a little bit. Probably the a amount of things that would need to happen for us to put this on a report after the response to earnings is is don't expect it to be on any report in the next month. Correct. Yeah, yeah. most likely. Yeah, it's got to shake out. You know, other stocks on the NASDAQ today here that are doing fairly well. Autodesk, we talked about C-Trip Win and Liberty Global. Some of the losers, NVIDIA, which has been in the news quite a bit here lately, Matt. Give me a chart on NVDA. Obviously tied to Bitcoin, tied to everything going on with chip makers. They had earnings. If it's tied to Bitcoin, and it is, you should not be an owner in, in NVIDIA in my estimation. Yeah, obviously very, very weak on the earnings here last week, continuing that downtrend and pressure. Chip makers in general have been under pressure. Take a look at Tesla, if you would. Uh, we don't. We haven't talked about Tesla much. Elon has kept his nose out of the news here recently. It's hitting a top, hitting a resistance, major levels here up here, Matt. Is there anything that you could do with Tesla here? Do you stay away from it because of the craziness of this company? What? What? What's I have a very hard time with Tesla because I feel like Elon lied to all of us. And I used to be in the I used to be in the fanboy club of you know, all, all things Elon Musk and. It's very well documented since August how, you know, upset I am at his manipulation of his stock price. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a hard time trading Tesla because I'm, I, I don't like trading stocks I'm emotional about, right? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, 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 how many of you guys read the Tackle Today email today? 
I loved that reading today. And, and I want to just show you a couple things here, Tim, and because it's very important. And if you guys don't get the tackle today, you can get it at obviously tackle trading. And then we have it right up here, tackle today. If you just click on that, you can always see that daily email that we do uh, to our to our members over there at Tackle Trading. And I just felt Christian did such a one, I love Christian's writing. I just love his writing. It's like he's speaking to me, you know, and I know he's not doing that, but that's just how I feel is it like he's speaking to me. And he talks about, you think money is real. No, that's you. You think money is real, but you, the trader, knows it's all Fugazi and it's a castle made of sand. You watch TV and go berserk with the news. You, the trader, don't watch TV, right? You care about your portfolio. I just, I loved it. And it just, it, it really spoke to me about the emotion that we all have about these companies that we either love or that we don't like. For example, I don't trade a lot of Goldman Sachs, Tim. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I can't stand that company and, I, and I'm biased against it, right? I don't trade a lot of Disney because it drives me nuts that my wife and my children have to go to Disney 19,000 times every single year. And I'm responsible for a quarter of their revenues, okay? That drives me nuts. So I don't like to trade it. I don't like to trade Tesla any longer because I'm emotional about it. And, and, and when you recognize that as a trader, it's just better to stay away. But I'm but as we're getting further from this, I just go back to that conversation we had with Jake Pelly. Okay. And and what was that? Two weeks ago, Tim? Yeah, a few we weeks brought, ago, yeah. A few weeks ago. So a couple of weeks ago, we brought Jake Pelly on the halftime uh, report and we interviewed Jake. And Jake's a wonderful, wonderful trader, great writer, loved everything about Jake. And he said, quote, every time Tesla gets into the 340 to 360 area. And it might have been 320, 340, 360. But as it gets up into their upper ends of those channels, what does he do? He starts buying put options. That's mm -hmm. what he does. Tesla has a very, very consistent track record at 360 and uh, of holding its, uh, its head at 360. It's been fascinating to watch Tesla actually go up in an environment where the market is going down on a company that is an extremely growth-driven company debt-driven, growth-driven company. I don't think we're going to see a breakout here of 360. If it did, I still want to buy it. Back but it I, out to a weekly. Let me make yeah, a simple but I argument. Still, but I still see potential on the downside. This is a debt-driven company and a market moving into a bear market that's at resistance that had no reason rallying to begin with. I know it's a very difficult stock to trade and I'm with you about the emotions. And I love that blog today, by the way. And, and you know, Matt, we did highlight, I, I do want to show you, uh, have you go to tackle trading's website. We move that menu. So that if you guys don't know where to find the blog, we actually put the tackle today blog as a button on the top of the screen and uh, people should be able to just find it right there. Boom. Tackle today on the left. Yep. Yeah. And very quickly, guys, we did do some a little bit of house cleaning on the website today, and we'll be doing some more over the next couple of weeks to make things easier for everybody to navigate. We put uh, our four core blogs up here under the blogs. They're moving into the pro version. Uh, courses here, you can kind of see the Tackle 25, Cashflow Condors, Bear Market Survival Guide. Those are premium systems uh, that uh, our pro members who uh, have access to that get access to the mastermind groups. You know, the shows, Traders Lounge. So uh, the old Coaches Lounge, ladies and gentlemen, we have rebranded to the Traders Lounge. Uh, so those are kind of ours onboarding. So you guys know if you're new to tackle trading, you can always go to onboarding on Monday right there. There's our core reports. What was called the scoreboard is now called the tackle newsletter. That's still it's it's going to be a very similar report, uh, but the scoreboard will always be in the tackle newsletter. So now that you see the tackle newsletter, it's just replacing the old scoreboard. And then you have the new link over here for the tackle today. And tackle today is our daily email. And if you and if you never if you don't get that, uh, make sure you're signing up for tackle trading. But if you just click on the tackle today, it's basically you know we also list it out as a daily blog over there at tackle trading and basically uh christian mark yourself whoever's doing the writing does a quick you know write up about what mm -hmm. they're feeling that day then they give the chart of the day i love i love what christian's creativity video of the day warren buffett's first television interview if you want to go back in time a little bit you could always learn from the oracle himself then obviously uh today's lineup that we do so make sure if if you ever you know get lost a tackle and you don't know what we're doing on that day you can always go to the tackle today and that'll let you know
Let's move on to currency and commodities here, Matt, in our analysis. Obviously, stock market trying to bounce here. You know, obviously, take it with a grain of salt. Tesla could be a good buy, sell, pass discussion on Twitter for a poll or something like that. You could have different opinions on that company. I'm sure oh, yeah, there are. Vastly different. different oh, I mean, from the, from the buyers to the sellers or the bulls to the bears, I don't think there's a company in the world right now that has more staunch disagreements. I mean, Tesla is basically – you know, playing out American politics in 2018. That's how divisive that company is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the short interest shows that, by the way, it has a very, very high short interest. 30% short interest. It's crazy. It's one of the top in the market. Uh, Dollar coming back here today, but a little tiny red candle after a big rally candle, still a bullish pivot relationship here, Matt. Uh, Not much to see here, in my opinion. Yeah, it's it, it's it's got to shake out, Tim. I, I mean, that I I I wish there was a trade every single moment of every single day on, in in the currency market, but you got to be patient. And when I when I say you got to let it shake out, you got to let the trend develop here. Um, you know, given the fact that you know we had divergence on the indicators, given the fact that that came down, kissed off ninety six. You know, those are positive type mom, uh, momentum. But I still think for any new buy uh, new buy type opportunity coming into the dollar, if you're not in that Canadian dollar or whatnot, you got to wait till it gets back up above ninety seven. You know, a couple of trades that I'm uh, that I'm looking at here. Obviously, this one's kind of already played out. But you got to love that Canadian dollar trade that we did in the forest report last week. But the, the other trade that I'm looking at here is the Japanese yen, Tim. And if in, in two things here I'm looking at here, and this will probably be on the report on Saturday as well. I'm looking for this to get back up above its 20-day moving average, Tim. Couple that with the dollar getting, not RTY, and I always get me DXY. So couple that. So the confirmation I'm looking for the Japanese yen, Tim, is I'm looking for the Japanese, the dollar Japanese yen pair to get above its 20-day moving average. Couple that with the dollar index getting back up above 97. That's the trade that I'm looking at making on the uh, on the dollar. So it's going to shake out a little bit. The Canadian dollar trade's probably already over if you haven't if you weren't already in it. But that is a trade I am looking at. You know, one thing on the euro dollar cross pair, I know that you had a, an avoid because of the headlines that just kind of goes to show here. Deputy Prime Minister Salvini from Italy was talking about how we can't talk about our deficit, uh, <laughs> I guess. Uh, Prime Minister Conti, the government convinced the budget draft is valid. Europe's a mess. It's a, it's a mess Europe's right now. Europe's a mess. It's yeah. it, when when people in America sit there and complain. I'm just Europe's a mess. Look at look what's happening in Europe. You want to talk about our deficit in the U.S.? Go look at the percentage of GDP around the world and see who's in more debt. Sure. It, you know, I mean, so no, I I just think this currency is going to be very difficult to trade over the next little over the next, you know, I, I would say weeks. I would say weeks. But we just got too much to contend with geopolitically in Europe right now. You know, and at this point, I know we're not quite at our, you know, fourth quarter point, but I see Coach Gino just joined us. Gino, come on in here and say hello. We're going to move on and talk about oil and some of the commodities. Gotta Perfect get time to get Gotta to get uh, Everybody say hi to the great Gino Poor. <clears throat> How to do? Well, let's share that beautiful uh, mug of yours, Gino. <laughs> oh, you know what? Uh, let me see. Uh, don't, give me, don't give me the I haven't showered yet. You're in a YouTube show, Gino. We're not showering until it's almost dinner time on Thanksgiving. <laughs> and the family starts showing up. But I'll tell you what, uh, the, the whole thing here is trying to figure out how to turn the camera on. Because, uh, I, 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 hold on. Let's just, let first, right? Let's just let this play out, Tim. Well, <laughs> don't have a camera, so. My favorite thing in the world is awkward moments, Matt. So I would do this all day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we don't Tim, need to. Tim would literally just sit here and wait till wait till Gino figures it out. But Gino, uh, whether you can figure out your camera or not, uh, I do want to get your take on crude oil, Gino. You okay. have you have more experience than than any other trader I personally know in the energy market itself, crude oil, natural gas, and 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 whatnot. You know, Gino. What's your take on crude oil with the recent sell-off and, and, and whatnot? It's simple, Matt. It really is. All you do is you turn on Kramer on CNBC. And whatever <laughs> he says, you do the opposite. You do the okay? opposite. <laughs> yeah. You know, whatever they're saying over there, just do the opposite. Um, CNBC, CNBC is losing their mind lately with Bitcoin and crude and, and whatnot. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a comedy <clears throat> fest over there. <clears throat> well, the sad thing is, is uh, here's the thing. Um, as a trader, you got to watch trader talk like this. When you're an investor, you watch CNBC. 
Mm -hmm. because what, what the mindset is, this is always, are you bullshit? Are you bullshit? You know? And so something's bullish. They're like, it's on fire. Bye, bye, bye. Then when it's pulling back, when do we buy? (laughs) It's like, it's like, and how long do we hold it for? So when I'm looking at oil as a trader, I'm looking at it as an option trader. And for me, it's a commodity. It doesn't go bankrupt. It's going to probably outlive me. Right. I don't know. I don't know. I feel pretty invincible lately, but I'll tell you, this pullback from 76.90 down to a low yesterday of 52.77, that's a pretty decent, decent drop. You know, I don't know what the percentage is because I don't have my calculator here, but it's a very, I mean, 20 bucks, 20 something dollars. That's a 25 bucks roughly, right? That's a big drop. What is that? Almost 30%. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm getting you the exact numbers right now. So when you take a world commodity, that's mostly priced in US dollars, like petrodollars, what have you. And you see a drop like that. Think of the billions and billions of dollars lost in that commodity. Mm. Think of the profit margins on the oil companies dropping, which is going to affect the energy sector longer term than this. And then real quickly, thinking about why aren't gas prices dropping in California has really got me boggled. <laughs> well, well, we got thirty percent drop in oil, but California's gas prices have. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. If we, I don't know if we need Gino to go off on an anti-California rant right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Here's the thing. Um, they're usually what, what it is, as you'll notice that after Thanksgiving, a forty holiday. It's a busy yeah. travel days today, guys. Right. You know, if you're a business, you're not going to lower prices today. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I look at it, guys, 31%. The actual numbers, it's 31.3% drop from the top to the bottom so far in this that in the last huge. month and a half. That is a massive movement, guys. That is the – that is one I, – and I don't, want, I don't want to misspeak here, but off the top of my head, that might be the biggest one-month move crude has ever had uh, to the downside. Yeah, I'm looking past history, Matt, and that's why I brought that up is – is that that is phenomenal. Now, why does it do that? We had a good run up. We did have a good run up, you know. And when I look at the 10-year chart, we actually back in 2014 had some huge drops from the 100 level all the way down to 46. Give me 20 or 30 years because I got to I got to uh, take issue with some of this logic. Uh, the reality is, no, it doesn't go bankrupt, but it's been at $20 a barrel. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying it, it won't go. Five was the low ready for this. And you're not thinking, you're thinking how many years back was that? And that was 2016, February. So it's not that long ago, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you look at oil, one of the world's commodities, look how volatile it is. That's an international commodity. One of the biggest in the world commodities that's traded heavily. And that's why these people like electric cars, get rid of oil Mm -hmm. and stuff. This is a huge, this is the backbone of many economies worldwide. But look at that drop. What do you think of that, Matt? What's that, what's that drop right there from 147? This was, this was the, um, this was the dot-com drop. Right, as you can see, kind of in July of, of 2008, down to the bottom. In, well, not, you know, not, not, dot com, you mean uh, financial? Uh, yeah, uh, subprime, subprime. Excuse me. So this was the drop in subprime. This was the drop when basically 14, 15, um, Saudi Arabia was trying to kill the frackers in the U.S. Right. So that's what that drop was. And then this one, this drop, guys, is basically a, it's a supply problem. Hmm. You, you have lack of demand, is, you have lack of demand, increasing supply. That, that's exactly what it is. So you got the dollar bullish, which makes, which is most oil is priced in, right? US dollar, which makes the price go down. But then you back that up with another indicator, the supply, which came out today, you know, mm-hmm. um, the supply, they were expecting, I don't know, 1.2 million barrels or something like that. They, they got, uh, they're 2.5, 2.5 yeah. and they got 4.9. Yeah. It's, so it's what's a- happened since September 26, every Wednesday when they come out, usually on Wednesday, with the inventories, the supply has been way higher than they expected. Yeah, September 26, 1.9 million barrels against a draw that they expected. 8 million barrels on October 3rd against one that they expected. 6 million barrels on October 11th against two. Last week, 10.3 million. 
Six against one on October 17th, six against three on October 24th, three against three on October 31st. At least uh, they got the EI numbers in line there, Matt. Uh, five against two on November 7th and uh, 10 against two on November 15th. They have tons more supply than what they've they expected supply. for a month it's and a half. Room. Huge, huge. Yeah. So they've beaten, the, the supply has been way higher than they estimated. And that one spike last week, what was it? 10 something, 10.3 mil. Mm -hmm. And they were expecting what? They were expecting like nine. Yeah, that's a huge miss. But here's the, the first thing. They always miss, okay? When it comes to oil, it's not like earnings. They always miss. Yeah. But it's been consistently way over on the supply. They actually nailed it on October 31st. They, they were pretty darn close. But until you see that starting to back off, not, not just you know the supply backing off, but they actually start hitting expectations because see the oil companies pricing and everything, when they start hitting expectations, they can budget. When there's an oversupply more than they expected, prices are going to come down because it's over inventory, oversupply. So you got the dollar, you got oversupply, you got talks about the OPEC negotiations overseas. It's a whole bunch of different things, seasonality. Um, but also what's interesting is, is the top in oil, if you look at the top in oil, what a big driver of the economy it is, was it in October, right? And if you go back to, well, you're on kind of a monthly chart right now. You're back to- No, I'm back, I'm back to daily. So where was the top at? 10.3. Yeah, October 3rd. And by the way, that's the top of the S&P. Yeah. That was the top of the S&P too. So oil is a big, big economic indicator. And we've seen in the past, anytime oil has really dropped big like this, big percentages, the market's followed. So it's okay if oil drops a little bit. But when you start talking 20, 30%, that's why I have triggers in there. Oil drops 15%. Watch the market because it's going to hurt the energy companies. Yeah. And oil, it's going to trickle down. Oil going down is not good for the U.S. economy. Yeah, it's not good for any economy. It really no. isn't. I mean, no, I, I mean, literally, like President Trump came out yesterday and said, we want oil to keep going down. The U.S. economy is doing better than ever. And we want to decrease interest rates. And I'm like, oh my God. It's not good for the economy. The only thing it's, it's good, good for, for is economy. prices at the gas pump when they, when they finally lower it, right? Well, yeah, but again, when in, in 2014, 2015, when that happened last time and we saw you know, oil go from what at the time, 107 down to 27, mm -hmm. gas prices only discounted. So that's like a 75% it, decrease in the value of oil. Gas prices didn't go down by 75%. Gas prices went down by maybe 10%, maybe 15, maybe 20 in some locations. They're not a one-to-one -one correlation. That extra, and I'm dead serious here, Tim and Gino, that extra $50 that that puts in the average American consumer's hands once a month is not good for the U.S. economy. That's not going to increase the, 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 velocity of spend, the velocity of consumer spending money enough to offset what it does to the entire stock market and the entire economy. It's just well, I'll give you some numbers on that, Matt. At 92 uh, million barrels per day, that represents about $2 trillion worth of value globally on an yeah. annual basis from oil. People don't really understand how big oil is. Like even here on the halftime yeah. report, we go through the commodities and we go crude oil, natural gas, all that kind of stuff. In relation, I mean, gold is only about $150 billion, you know. Uh, crude oil is like $2 trillion. Yeah, on an it, annual it goes, basis. Listen, it goes. This is the this is the, the liquid nature of all markets. Dollar one, euro two, oil three. Hmm. That's 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 the, how big that market is. The oil market is bigger than the stock market. A lot of people don't understand that on a daily basis. More money, more transactions. Oil is big, big, big business here. This to me, and you're seeing subtle changes here in the trend. But this, to me, is something that's going to, we're going to have to contend with for the for the next months. What are your oh, expectations from an economic perspective? Yeah. So, so here's my thing. As a trader, my perspective is I love this. Why? Because I'm a naked put seller. I love long term holding gold and silver for portfolio hedge, both the paper asset and the physical. I don't know if you've ever. Well, I know Tim has, and you have Matt, but um, going into gold stores and just buying couple ounces here and there, you know, it always and, makes, it's therapeutic for somebody that hates fiat currencies. Well, here, here, here was what I like to buy silver as like, you know, the, 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 what do you call it? The, uh, and the little bullions, the little, you can buy them in grams. You can buy them, 
you know, the little silver eagles, whatever. Uh, but when it comes to gold, <laughs> my wife and I prefer to buy jewelry. <laughs> but, you know, that way you can show it off. But <laughs> here's the thing is that's a portfolio hedge. It's long term. It hedges your portfolio. It gives you it gives you the rights of passage to go to any country with your currency. You know, it's your it's your safety net as you build wealth. And you don't understand that until you start building wealth that, you know, wow, what if my dollar goes worthless like a Yap Island? But here's the thing. I also like certain commodities for that. And I like to hold in my portfolio oil because for, to me, a lot of people disagree with me. Oil to me is an international commodity and currency. So in my portfolio, I can hold the oil futures and um, store those. It's easier. It's like, storing, it's like storing gold in the cloud. You know, you can store your futures. And then what I do is I sell calls against it and I take assignment on it, but you have to have a futures background. You have to have a futures education. You have to understand what it means to hold a gold, an oil future and the, you know, the CL and understand options. If you don't, you would do something like USO, which is an ETF. Same thing. Some people like to buy ETFs like oil. And I like how it's dipping down right now. It's cheap, a USO. It's just, there's more premiums on the futures. There's more leverage on the margins. Well, let, let, me, let, me, let me say something to that very quickly. Both Gino and I and Tim, we, we probably do more futures than on USO. Mm -hmm. But I've seen people who don't understand futures get involved in futures and blow up accounts with futures, even professional traders. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to throw that out there. I, you know, yeah, you can go get 25%, 25% ROI on a five delta natural gas contract right now. But yet, just as a reminder, there was a massive hedge fund that blew up their entire hedge fund by doing naked calls and naked puts. Two or three hundred million market. dollars in about two weeks. Okay, and this was just in the last two weeks. So, yeah. you know that that's great, right? But for most people, I would I would highly recommend that they stay away from selling naked anything naked in the futures market. Do more credits in the futures market. But if you're looking to take ownership long term, you don't you never do that in the futures market. You always do that with USO. Yeah. You know, what's amazing, Matt, is if you don't have the correct education, really what the education is not only the mechanics of getting in the trade, is the mechanics and education of what could happen if this does this. Now, looking at like we just did that chart of oil going back to, to 20 years and you see a 50 percent drop. You got to expect that could happen to me tomorrow. And mm -hmm. you have to look at that just like when people are buying houses in the mid, you know, middle or excuse me, 2000 and up to 2007. What if interest rates do go up to here? Do they calculate that in? You have to build that in. So when I hear about that hedge fund, it's like psychology, you're going, oh, this guy must be a professional. But here's the thing. They weren't educated. They or if they oh, were yeah. educated, they well, knew the risk. Right. I, 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 they did, they were, they were professional traders running a $300 million hedge fund. They had education. Yeah. They had education, education on how to get the into problem. the trade, but they knew Greed. their risk. They Greed was the risk. problem here. Greed was that problem. That's it. Greed took over their education. If they were educated enough to go, wow, this could drop and do this. They were over margined. They were over leveraged and they were gambling when they weren't, they weren't using risk management skills. And you're like, really? You didn't know that can happen to you? And that's what's scary with a third party manager is you're going, this guy's a professional, millions and billions of dollars. And they did that? Really? Yeah. Well, and there's a lot to that. I mean, I want you guys to think about a couple of things. Uh, there have been quants with an IQ of 150, 160 that know more about markets than the three of us that have lost their hedge funds. Yeah. There are people, I mean, you have to admit humility in some regard. There are people that know more about certain things than we do, and they still have, and we're experts, guys. We've been in the market, you know, you've been in the market 20 years, and they still lost everything. There are risks that even if they do have great reward, that might not be appropriate to take, you know. And I know that oil has got a great opportunity down here, but it's in a downtrend. I, Selling I, it naked put out yeah. of the money in, in a downtrend to me is something that a pro has to do that has hedging ability well, beyond regard. For example, okay, you can go out right now and you can go on USO and you can go sell a 15 Delta contract, $10, $10 on a $10 ETF. 
you can get $15, and I'm just doing it one contract, versus a buying power of, say, $100. Mm-hmm. $100 minus commission. You're talking 14 to 15% ROI on a 15 delta. That is 85% probability at expiration, obviously not touch. We talked about that last week. That's a wonderful trait. It's a sure. wonderful trait. But why are you getting 15% ROI? Because look what's happened to oil over the last month. The reason you're getting a higher ROI is because there's a lot more risk in that contract right now, even with that 85% probability. The only way I think you could ever justify that is if you want to take ownership of oil at $10 on USO and you want to own it long term. In, in, in terms of how much that would be, you're talking about on the crude oil contract using the same contract month, same delta here. And you can figure out percentage wise as well, but this is just easier. Mm-hmm. So going out 30 days, Tim, 15 delta, that would have to go to 48 to 47 for you to take ownership at 10 right? So it'd have to come down to here in the next 30 days for you to take ownership of 10. So the question that I have is, does anybody want to take ownership of 47? Not at $10 on USO, but at $47 on crude, crude light. Gino might. And I would, well, maybe Gino would, but Gino's been trading this contract for 20 years. And it's simple as this, Matt. What's the risk on that? Bring up that trade. Let's look at the risk. And I'm going to position size to that risk, the total risk, not if it goes to 42 or 40. I'm going to look at that and say, okay, what's that risk? And you got, you got to say, okay. And a, ta- a lot of people be talked out of it because they're like, you know what? That's too much risk versus reward. Well, then it's not your trade. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, 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 everybody's blinded. Who said the magic word earlier? Agreed that, well, I can make. 15 bucks. If I do a hundred of these, that's $1,500. Wow. That's so golden that I'm not even going to look at the risk. And and I I see people do it every day. Oh, I had to, because I need that money. What? I, I personally would shy away from selling naked puts on oil until we start seeing any semblance of a Yeah. And you know, until they start on the, the oil numbers that come out every week, until they start getting closer to the expectation number, um, that that's when you're not going to see the, the supply, um, you know, they got to get close to the expectation number. Then you got to see that dr- dropping down, you know, and, uh, I'm not even going to get into natural gas right now because that's one that people, <laughs> well, let's get into it. Bring up. Angie. Oh no, you're going <laughs> to, <laughs> what a wild market. I mean, it's just why, you know, when you see parabolic moves like this, you know, it's probably hedge funds and, and institutions that are being forced into net debit and, they have to liquidate, correct? Because this is not normal movement in the last two weeks. So I'm guessing that some big players probably got wiped out of the market. Uh, that parabolic uptrend that just took off like 15, 20% a day, Matt, and then back and back and back and back until you see some kind of stability, Gino. I mean, what do you do with a market People, when it goes crazy like this? Well, that that's the thing is if you don't understand the animal you're dealing with here, th- this guy gets volatile and Again, looking at the natural gas storage numbers, which actually came out today, which is usually Thursday, right? Um, they had a drawdown. Mm-hmm. So there's a big, and that, that we're, they never hardly ever do that this time of year. I mean, then we start getting drawdowns right about, yeah, that's about the start. And this is it. This is a start. This is, we were building all the way up until last week. So the number came out. That's a big drawdown. Right. And that that's a huge difference when you're looking at the expectations. So we're going to stay this way all the way until probably historically Easter. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, we're going into winter, but look at the price up here. Look at the price up here. So do I, if I'm in the money on naked calls right now, you can't expect this to drop. I mean, we're going into winter and there's drawdowns in the inventory This is manipulation. This is fear in the market. This is controlling the contracts. This is something you don't want to be in. So this right here, to answer your question, stay away. 
I don't care how professional you are. Stay away from this. Matt, that's exactly what you said yesterday. And I think this goes back to the entire and kind of tie the whole conversation here together. And I'm going to preach here for a minute. One of the best things about tackle trading is the community aspect of it. Guys, just through our discussion here today in the halftime report, there's opportunities in stocks up and down. There's bull plays and bear plays and naked put plays in commodities. And there's all kinds of different things that you can do. You can trade Forex. There's a million different ways to trade. We don't just say that there's one way to trade, No. Uh, but if you try to trade on your own without other people's opinion and input and insight into what the market is doing, you will eventually find yourself in a very lonely room and probably up against the wall against the market. You have to have a team and a community of people to think critically, Matt, and it's okay that at tackle trading, we have differences of opinion. In oh, fact, absolutely. that's the value of tackle trading. The coaches don't always disagree on this halftime report all the time. Sure. Well, you know what? Here's the thing, Tim, is I get people asking me, did you see the move in natural gas? Did you say, well, in fact, I asked you guys, did you guys see natural gas a few days ago? You know, did you see, but you think to yourself, am I missing something here? Is, am I missing out on something? There's a lot of volatility here. So what happens? You'll notice this happens every week, at least once. Amazon, Tesla, Chipotle, somebody will make a huge move. They'll talk about it. And traders go, especially new traders, what am I supposed to do with this? Am I missing out? No, this is the kind of stuff we don't like, this huge, unexpected volatility. There's ways to play it with, you know, straddle, strangle type plays and stuff like that. There's ways to play it. But honestly, when you look at this and you can't predict what's going to happen, you don't have the edge. The, you know, the trend's not in your favor. You don't know what's going on. This is just crazy volatility. The mm -hmm. average range per day, look at the range on the candle per day versus what it was a month ago. That, that's just sick. I mean, if you can't stomach that, which most traders don't want to stomach that, because if you have a big portfolio, you don't want to spend the majority of your time managing this one. It's increased by 200%, guys. The yeah, range. That's, that's too much. That's too much volatility yeah. even for me, Matt. I like excitement and everything. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to look at this thing for 10 minutes just on this, when you have 80 positions well, to manage. I, I've always felt like when things go parabolic and they get they go outside their their typical behavior, I'm always a stay away. I, I always am. I, I, I did it with Bitcoin when it got crazy. I did it with the weed stocks when it got crazy. I'm doing it with natural gas when it went parabolic. When things go outside normal fundamental behavior, I, I'm out. I'm out. Yeah, and the, you know yeah. what? You know what, Gino? I'm okay with missing out on that opportunity because I've been a trader for 15 years. I'm yeah, okay. and there's only one way to deal with stocks and commodities like this is, number one, you have a good strategy where you play both sides, like a straddle, strangle, debit, condor, something like that. And you understand how to babysit that, which takes a lot of education. And secondly, day traders love this. Day traders love big candles like this. They'll go into the intraday chart and play these big moves. 200% is huge. Sure. That means like 200 days in one. And you play those little swings with your tight stops. Day traders are excellent. They love this. And that's not very much education near the, like the options. This is basic mas mastery. Look at all those swing highs you could play right there. Look at all those setups, you know? So this is actually a fun one to practice if you've never day traded. And, you know, people do trade the futures. I for think day if trade. anybody was practicing day trading on natural gas over the last week, they've quit their trading career. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mover. Impossible. Oh, say la vie, boys. I got to tell you, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm just thinking, this is why I love our, our company. Gino, uh, bringing you on here. Thanks for coming to join our halftime crew. A lot of students that you know. Gino, you've been doing a lot of those coaches lounges lately. And by the way, I, I've gotten a lot of really good insight. And Traders lounge, Tim. Our, Traders Lounge now, new new name of it. I don't know, Gino. Gino, did you see that we we changed our menu up uh, today? Here, we finally got it live. Yeah, yeah. Traders Lounge, Traders Lounge, because you know it just uh, sounds good. And we went to the newsletter, which is the scoreboard. We went to the scoreboard. I don't think Gino like. I don't think Gino liked that newsletter uh, name change, Tim. That's well, okay. Tackle newsletter. My student goes, "Where's the scoreboard at?" And I go, "It's, it's under it's, there." So if you click Tackle newsletter, it still says scoreboard. Yeah, but. Yeah. But uh, that's where it is because that is where we stand. I mean, bottom line, the scoreboard is what you look at, right? So we, mm -hmm. we bottom line it for you there. And it's so nice, Matt. You can just jump on that gridiron, pick a sector, and you oh, know yeah. exactly which stock to pick. And then, by the way, guys, the, I'm getting a lot of feedback 
that people love the gridiron on the commodities. And oh yeah, and we did make that change about a month and a half ago. Um, but every every report, uh, the tackle newsletter will have the market scoreboard in there, and then in the commodity and the forex report, we have scoreboards for those different currencies and those different commodities as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. and hopefully we have one little link there sometime where you click it and all the gridirons are lined up in a row, you know, mm-hmm. or just one big gridiron with everything. But yeah, that's great. So you could do the forex. I mean, how helpful is that? How much time does that save you? It's the whole point. I mean, it uh, that's take me time putting it get, putting it together takes you, a lot of time. Just when you put it together, and yeah. it looks cool. I love I love the new scoreboard. I think I think it's awesome. I love the visuals of the new scoreboard. Um, Tim, take us out. We got uh, we got Couple Cyber things. Monday guys coming up, right? Couple of things we got to do to set this up here, though, Matt. Uh, I do want to look at gold before we finish analysis. Uh, I would be remiss if we did not finish all of our routine here. Uh, gold is showing some strength. That's a 15 minute chart. It has not triggered yet. By the way, I did uh, talk about this a couple of weeks ago. If you're looking for a great Christmas gift, a silver coin to one of your family or friends, if that's about the right price point, 20 bucks, not a bad thing. Promote the idea of of metal ownership. I've liked that doing that for a long time. Uh, Give me the RTY as well, Matt. We did skip that one earlier. Same thing. Same kind of thing. And then the last one, one of the stock picks, that we highlighted yesterday, Applied Materials, AMAT, if you would. And go and review those reports. We got a trigger here developing. I would not be triggering into new trades going into Thanksgiving here. I would wait. No, Probably and neither is Applied day. Materials. Remember, Applied Materials got a trigger with the close above 36. Sounds good. Right. Thanks, uh, guys. Great job, Cody. Great job, Matt. Thanks for being here, Gino. Appreciate you. Yep, Thank thanks, you Gino. Guys. Appreciate yep. it.